I'd like to call to order the regular Board of Education business meeting. Uh, welcome you all for coming. And Rebecca, again, would you take attendance, please? Anthony Amato? Here. Valerie Anderson? Here. Alan Brown? Here. Gregory Cava? Here. I'm here. Michelle Gora? Emily Hibbard? She's here. Yep, she's here. Uh, James Hirschfield? Here. Jennifer Pody? Here. Michael Sinatra? Peter Tagley? Here. Sydney Warble? Here. All right, thank you. So we're all here. The only ones missing are Michelle Gora and Michael Sinatra. All right, uh, item two on the agenda, opportunity. And for those who weren't present, board members, just remember if you want to speak, to press the button so the green light's on. Turn it off, turn it, and the red light will come on. And stay about a foot away from the microphone is what we're told is the best. All right, item two on the agenda, opportunity for the public to comment on agenda items. Is there anyone who'd like to address us? Sir, would you go up to the, uh, uh, the podium and just state your name and what town you're from, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gary Lord from Roxbury. I have, I have um, one concern that's really two concerns, and that is a uh, quarter of a million dollar renovation to the teacher's lounge, is it? Mm -hmm. No, the teacher, teacher work area, quarter of a million dollars. First, I wonder, do we need to spend a quarter of a million dollars uh, revamping the teacher's area? And, and my second concern is that the quarter of a million dollars is shown in the operating budget as our normal operating expenses, whereas it appears to be obviously a capital improvement. And a capital improvement, in my mind, should be funded by the 1% capital fund that was established a number of years ago where 1% of our budget is contributed annually to go towards these capital projects. So I, ho I, I, hope, I just hope the board will consider those thoughts when they come up with a final budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just for clarification, what we've heard tonight is the presentation of the budget by the superintendent for proposed budget. The board will consider the budget it's on the agenda for tonight. The board may c commence discussing it. I don't know what the board wants to do, but at, we have another meeting scheduled for next week for discussion of the budget. At some point, the board will approve <laughs> its own budget for presentation to the public. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Angela Macciarulo. I am a parent from Burnham School in Bridgewater. It seems last year at this very time when I should have been home watching the Yukon Huskies, I was here fighting for a school nurse. Now I'm here fighting again for classes for my kids. When Dr. Cosentino wanted the AgriSTEM program, I sat through no less than three presentations with video, with uh, comments with a big public relations layout because that was something that was being supported. I had to find out about a cut to a teacher for my kids today. There was no presentation. There was no email. There was no let me come down and talk to the parents of Burnham. We pay taxes. My taxes are not going down and I'm happy to pay the taxes I do to get the education that my kids are currently getting. I have a sixth grader here who hit the ground running. I have parents all around me pulling their kids out, yanking them out to send them to private schools, and I sit there and say, my kid's doing great. Why would I pull my kids out to put them in a school that has six or seven kids when I'm getting that where I am? You say that we're a school of distinction? Keeping it a school of distinction is not going to happen if you start cutting. We have a K-1. K-1 is pretty closely affiliated when it comes to coursework. 2-3 is not. I have a second grader. I have a third grader. I look at where my second grader is today, and I say, if you combine him with the third grade, he is not going to be where his brother is at this time next year. 
you're going to have a half-time 0.5 math interventionist. We're touting this AgriSTEM program. What are we going to do with science? Are we going to have a science interventionist? Who's going to feed into that AgriSTEM program when my child is not going to have a full-time teacher for writing? I'm a lawyer. I see horrible writing samples every single day. If you can't write, if you don't know English, you can forget it in this world. If you don't have science, we're touting the AgriSTEM program, yet we're cutting my child's science teacher. There are many other ways, I believe, that we can get this done. I don't see anybody in Bridgewater complaining about their taxes to the point where we have to cut a teacher. We live in a bilingual society, and now we want to cut our Spanish teacher, too. Every day I deal with people who don't speak Spanish, or don't speak English. I don't speak Spanish. I'm at a clear disadvantage. Bringing the K-1 and, and claiming that, oh, these kids will be back together again in 2-3, there are four parents sitting here from that original K-1. None of us are supporting this. There are two parents at home who couldn't be here tonight. They are not supporting it. You want to attract people to Bridgewater, and you want to attract people to Region 12. The first thing that anybody says when they go to buy a house anywhere in this country, how are the schools? You're not going to be able to say that the schools are great. You want to bring people in, have a phenomenal school system. I feel like we didn't consolidate, OK? We voted in AgriSTEM, and now we're going to act like vultures and pick apart the elementary schools in order to pay for AgriSTEM? If we are paying millions of dollars for AgriSTEM, don't do it on the backs of our elementary schools. Again, I work for the state of Connecticut. We don't have a $250,000 teacher lounge. I love our teachers. They should have a great place to go sit. $250,000 for a teacher lounge? That sounds unconscionable to me when you want to cut my child's teacher. None of this is making any sense to me. I don't like the way it was, it was in my mind, secretly done as, as a line item with absolutely no forewarning to the parents of Burnham. Again, I pay taxes, I pay high taxes, I have a part-time trooper, I have a volunteer fire, fire department, I have no trash collection, I'm fine with that. I will continue to pay my high taxes as long as my kids get the phenomenal education that they have been getting. They need to do this on a going forward basis. You all sit here, you're professionals, you're in business, you cannot get your kids into good colleges if you don't give them the basis of a good education in elementary school and going forward. So I would urge you to reject this plan, keep the elementary schools the way they are until you come up with a better plan, a different plan, but a plan that does not hurt children. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Sir. My name is Jeremy Tendler. I live in Washington. My kids go to Burnham. Uh, I have my older son who was part of the K-1 in the first round. He's now in second grade. My younger son is in kindergarten in the K-1 now. I'm looking at this giant thing on the board here. It says creating opportunities for the future. And my question is that how are we going to do that? How are we creating opportunities by reducing the number of instructors that we have in our schools? I don't see that making a lot of sense. And at the same time, we're talking about hiring a full-time talented and gifted instructor. So the question is, you're going to cut Spanish for all the kids. You're going to half time, you know, reduce that by half time. You're going to cut a full-time teacher in third grade, but then you're going to hire somebody who's going to cater only to talented and gifted kids. So what that means to me is that you're cutting some instructor for everybody in order to provide something special for a small subset of students. And that just doesn't seem fair to me. Uh, maybe I'm crazy. Um, one of the other slides that were up here, I'd love to be able to flip through the slides for you, but talked about building capacity. I, same problem comes up here. How are we building capacity by reducing the number of teachers? Um, 
I don't understand how we're going to market this school system and try and bring people in when we're compromising our curriculum. I don't understand how you could possibly combine second and third grade without compromising your cur curriculum in some way. You're going to have one teacher teaching third graders who have to take standardized tests and second graders who don't have that requirement. The one thing that makes that K-1 class work is that you have a full-time teacher and a full-time para who is a former teacher of the year, right? I mean, she was an award-winning teacher as a paraprofessional that's in that. So essentially, you have two teachers in that K-1 class, which you are not going to have if you combine that second and third grade class. I agree with the previous speaker that it was a little bit disingenuous the way we were sold the AgriSTEM, which I wholeheartedly support. I love the AgriSTEM program. I can't wait for my kids to take part in it. But we voted to spend all this extra money on the AgriSTEM, and nobody mentioned, well, hey, but we're going to cut some teachers out of Burnham to help pay for it. That's all I got. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Carol? Good evening, everybody. My name is Carolyn Dwyer. I live in Bridgewater, and I wear a few hats. Um, one is I'm helping represent the parents tonight as the Burnham School PTO president, um, but I'm also tasked with helping to market our region and our town right now. Um, I thank Pat for the great presentation. I think it's wonderful to see that we're actually making some great changes and we're pushing forward. I was here last year at this time. We were talking about a nurse and we were talking about merged classes and we were talking about why the K-1 worked and all of that. I hope you all remember those discussions. Um, I think in a year we've made some great strides. We have the Ag STEM under our belt, and that will start to help market our area. Um, I'm also very proud of the ACE program, which will be a bookend to the other end and will help provide um, care for our families after school. We're looking forward to expanding that into Roxbury, and we're even working with Michelle Gore to expand it into Washington. Um, however, this one piece sort of sticks out in our minds as a thorn in our side, which is this multi-grade, multi-age Piece. And while I understand, in theory, that, you know, how do you put a teacher in there for six kids, five kids, seven kids, I also know that wearing my different hats and doing all the research that I've done, we have a few problems, and we haven't been able to really solve them yet. Um, one of them is that the research shows that this is not a great idea. You can say Warren's doing it, and Warren is doing it for, you know, a lot of reasons that we know, which is they didn't consolidate and so Warren you know had to go this route um, the other places that do it are Indian reservations and rural towns in Maine so that's not really where I think we should be going educationally um, and then of course I have you know our own town concerns about how do we spin this how do we turn around and say we've got ag stem but don't worry you know I'm sure your child wants to be in this experiment I know personally I don't want this experiment for my own child. Um, you know, fortunately, it's not my kid next year. My daughter's going to be in fourth. But if I see what's coming, and I'd be a fool not to see what's coming, um, she'll be part of the experiment four and five. And then, you know, then we'll see what happens. And what happens then is the Dwyers leave the system. And so what happens then is the self-fulfilling prophecy, which we're all concerned about, is trying to retain some of these families. And then what happens is you lose them. So, um, you know, I have a lot of specific concerns, and I'm sure you'll hear them from the other parents and from myself again next week, that we still have an answer from, from last year, how you merge the curriculum, how you prepare the third graders for SBACs when the second aren't taking it. You know, I, there, it just goes on and on. I have a huge long list here of how you do it um, or how things that concern us. Um, how, do, how does Burnham eventually function with only three teachers? I mean, have we thought about that? I mean, a lot of this is sort of long-term thinking. So are we going to go multi-grade? Pat referred that, you know, we might go multi-grade for the whole region. Okay. So that to me says we've got a lot of real deep thinking here to think and, and a lot of research to be done because I've read it and it doesn't sit well with me. There's one expert, she's in Arizona. I read her, her website, her website's full of spelling mistakes. That's not who I'm going with. 
as our expert. Um, so, you know, I hope that the board does that research. I hope you guys decide if this is where the region really wants to go or are there other options. You know, for us, um, we've suggested a few, for example, and I'd really love to see this, a formal letter from the, the administration that goes to the WF, WPS parents that says, hey, you guys might be in a class of 22, come on over to the class of six. Maybe you'll have a couple of parents that say, well, you know what, I work that way, I drive that way every day, I can take advantage of the ACE program, I can stay there till six, it's a perfect win for our family. So, you know, while M Curtis Reed, the first selectman and I are out presenting to Southbury and we're going to real estate tours in Brookfield, why aren't we looking within our own walls? You know, we're doing our part here, we've got our video, we've got our brochure, we're selling it hard, but we also need your help and we also can't be hindered. So, you know, those are some of the things that I'd really like you to think about as you start to deliberate this. Um, and then, you know, I'm sure you'll hear from a lot of other parents as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Last time. Mm -hmm. My name is Matt Denning. I'm from Bridgewater. Um, my son Liam is going to be in third grade next year. Um, I was wondering if someone from the board could come up here and explain to me and my wife and everyone else why this would be a good idea. Would, would someone come up and try to explain? No, that's not a, what we're doing tonight. Okay. This is a chance for you to comment to us. We'll listen to what you have All right. to say. Well, I think it's a bad idea. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you all. We appreciate it. All right, moving on, uh, item three is the consent agenda. Is there anyone who wants to remove anything from the yeah. consent? Oh, consent, let me just finish. Consent agenda, which is the Education Committee meeting minutes from February 22nd, 2016. Greg? Yeah, I'd like to move to remove these, and I'll, I'll explain why. I think there is an error that needs to be Representative O'Neill arriving without any indication that the board. I'm sorry. Yes, you're button. Button. No, sorry. Uh -huh. Forgot about that. Uh, okay, so I, I think we need to remove this from the consent agenda to repair the minutes. Yeah. And the executive session at the end, we went into executive session, that's all correct. But then we have Representative O'Neill arriving, and he did not arrive and enter into an executive session. We left executive session, he came out. He, he presented and then we went back into executive session. So that needs to be corrected. Now, are you telling me that isn't what happened? No. Yeah. By definition, we had to go out of executive session. You don't have the, the representative in executive session. That's correct. Go ahead, Pat. Let me, Debbie. It's on. It's on. It's not there. It's not doing that. There we go. Um, Mrs. Blavin, please correct me if I'm incorrect. Uh, we um, reviewed the tapes. The, um, when you went into executive session, there was never a vote taken. Am I correct? To go into executive session. Right. So when... Uh, yeah, there was. You, there, reflected here in the minutes. It was never um, all right, all right. voted. Debbie, am I correct? It was never voted on. It was never voted. It may have been firsted and a second, but it was never voted to go into executive session. So we didn't know exactly how to write these minutes correctly because these, this is, this, as of what happened on the tape, this is what happened on the tape. All right, well, I, I still think we should move to remove it from the consent agenda. I, I'd like to listen to the tape. We'll try to figure out what happened, but this is, this is not my recollection of what happened. All right. There's irrespective of what the tape says. All right, then it is removed from the consent agenda. I think, as I recall what happened, there was a motion to go into executive session, which was seconded. At that moment, Representative O'Neill walked in. Mm -hmm. We did not go into executive session. He made a presentation to us. After he left, we voted again to, to go into executive session, which we did, and then came out of executive session. Right, so. but that's not reflected here. I that understand second that. Motion so we'll remove reflected. it from the consent agenda, and we'll correct the minutes to okay. reflect what actually happened. If it requires listening to the tape, we will do that. Is, is there anyone else who wants to be heard on that? All right, thank you, Greg. 
All right, report of the chair. I have nothing other than to congratulate uh, our Chapog swim team, which has uh, done an amazing job, some great uh, individual accomplishments uh, over the, this past weekend. And so congratulations to them. Uh, item five, superintendent's report. Yes, thank you. Um, I am uh, going to ask Ms. Files to put up the new, um, and we're just asking, uh, hopefully, that you're okay with it. The color is very poor here. You can't see the color, but that's the Chapag logo. Um, this was put together by a graphic artist alum from Chapag. Am I correct, Aaron? Do you remember his name? Yeah, uh, Jason. Jason, Jason Walsh, two, uh, 2009 graduate. He's a, a professional <coughs> illustrator artist at the moment. Right. So this, um, he worked with Matt Paracci and the kids. I think everybody liked it. We liked that it was non-gender. We liked that it was slick. And then he has different iterations. You can write Chapag there. You can put it in the, the thingy that way. There you go. So I think, um, again, this has been a long time coming. The, the, the um, former um, logo was very cartoonish, and it had a couple, excuse me, of different iterations. So we're going to go with this, and um, we also have a Pantone color. So we will have the same color for everything, uniforms and everything. So we're, you know, it's really a professional look that we're going for, and so we just wanted to show that to you. You can certainly send any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I any, hold on. Is there anyone who wants to be heard on this? All right. Thank you. Okay. Actually, no, but going forward, will our You got to put your thing on. Going forward, we're our, since we're, you know, 6 through 12, will our middle school start being the right colors for yes. high school? Awesome. Yes. We're all, as soon as we redo uniforms, et cetera. Well, it's hard to buy two-color headbands. You right. Know, the royal. Yeah. I think, yeah. Anthony, did you want to be heard? If I could okay. turn this on. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, I think it's a huge improvement um, to what we had. So I think it's great. Oh, uh, and, and the, the use of the Panatone colors and establishing consistency is, is, is wonderful, right. in my humble opinion. My request, though, is that when we do this, that we need to make a real concerted effort to expunge the old from the yes. system and not keep it around because we paid for something right, that right, was right. printed years ago. I mean, I think it's really important for the branding and the imaging that, you know, that we got to treat those things as sunk costs and just right. make the switch. Okay. Right? Very good. Absolutely. We'll work on that. Okay, great. Uh, I do want to just reiterate one more time that um, Mrs. Gallo did bring up the uh, six letters today to the state um, that were signed by the sending towns stating that they are willing to um, uh, send more than their three-year averages to the new uh, agri-science STEM program. So that is condition two. We're waiting to get a response from Ellen Cohn, who will um, let us know. Greg? Yeah, Pat, have you transmitted this information to the Education Committee? The state, at the State Board of Ed? The legislature, no. At the Not, legislature. I'm waiting for Ellen to confirm that it meets condition two, then we will do that. We should hear from her tomorrow. Thank you. And then the other, um, I wanted to say something else and I forgot. Okay, it may come back to me later. I want to thank um, um, the chairman and uh, Jen Pody and Rebecca all for coming to Minds in Motion. It was wonderful to see you and I really appreciate that. And one more time, I want to congratulate the juniors about 100% attendance at on the SAT. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are many schools that are having a lot of angst over getting kids to show up for the tests. And 100%, it, it's, it's a big deal. So we're really, really excited about that. That's great. Yeah, thanks. I, I, sh I didn't mean to interrupt. I should have mentioned in my report, I did come to the Minds in Motion presentation. It was very... Um, didn't realize all the things that were going on, quite frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was very educational and a lot of folks. I was expecting more, quite frankly, of a science fair being put on by the students, but it wasn't that at all. It was adult program, programs that were being presented by adults and available to this system. And there was a lot of work being done mm -hmm. and uh, was very informative. So I appreciate you setting that up. Yeah. And they were very enthused. Yes. So it's good. Jennifer?
Um, what I loved was there were a lot of families that were outside the region that were here, which I thought was really exciting. Mm -hmm. It was their first time seeing Chapag, and I thought that that was a really great opportunity, which I felt Pat did a great job on speaking to. And there were a couple of parents that actually came up to me who are outside the district who were intrigued by what you said about our tuition, mm -hmm. which I thought was exciting. I thought, I just want to comment too, I know you did, about the committee who worked on Minds in Motion. They did an amazing job. They worked their tails off and it showed and I just want to thank them for their hard work because it showed and it was exciting. And you know, my son took a couple of the workshops and he loved them and I went and visited a couple of the workshops too. And so it was really an exciting day here. I was very excited to be part of it. That's it. All right. Thank you. And that is my report. Yeah, what about oh, personnel? What? Oh, I'm sorry. All right, personnel. Um, we have a part-time paraprofessional, Richard, Richard Eddy. And we have a part-time paraprofessional, uh, Amy Rutzel, and that's at Burnham, which you asked about last week, um, Alan. All right. Any questions for the superintendent? All right, thank you. Committee reports. Uh, Agri-Science Steering. Anthony, anything? Not at this time. All right, education. Michelle is not <coughs> here. Uh, I know that we have an education committee meeting. Next week. Uh, March 21st, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, education Connection, we don't have a representative for Education Connection. Facilities, Greg, any report? No, no report. The minute, the, well, the minutes uh, that we're working on are actually in. And you have to be closer to the mic. The, uh, the, minutes, that we're, the, the, uh, the, the minutes that we're working on of our last meeting are, are in the materials that have been shared with you, uh, and we're, I don't have anything to add to those. I think right. they pretty well tell you what we've been up to. All right, thank you. Finance, Valerie, anything? I thought she was here. She was. Oh. oh, while you're waiting for her, can I add one thing? Uh, one, one of the reasons why our capital budget is down for the, for the district is because of the new agri-science program that's coming in, we're uh, trying to conserve the ability of our facilities department and facilities director to really concentrate efforts very much on that. So we're, we're not starting as many things out there in the, in the thing, and that's one of the reasons why the capital budget is down. All right. That's the only thing I had to add. Uh, just going back to finance, Valerie, is there any report? Yes. <clears throat> I went out and talked to some of those parents. Oh. Because I do think we have to just politely say there will be a dialogue. Right. You need to put, turn on your... Turn on your microphone, please. <laughs> now start again. The green light's got to be on. I mean, the, you know, my public has spoken here. <laughs> OK. I did go out to talk to the, that group of parents, because I think it's the correct thing to do, to let them know they took time of their, out of their evening to come here. We don't just set up numbers to set up numbers. We don't get rid of, of, of uh, teachers just to do it. It's a well thought through process, but we can't engage. I explain that to them, and that later in tonight's meeting, perhaps we'll have a conversation about some issues, and then we'll have a workshop. I thought it was very important to tell them, mm -hmm. because they had questions, and they kind of had misconceptions. You know, the idea of having all the kids from Burnham uh, in the kindergarten, first, second, third, or however, be bussed over to, to Booth is logical, but we can't do it. And they don't necessarily know that. So, okay, back to finance. So I invited them to come to the workshop and or hang out for later in the agenda. So we had our meeting, we discussed the uh, financial, um, let me get my notes. They're kind of mad out there, so I had to talk fast. Though I don't think they have much to be mad about once they know. Okay, so we have 1.4% remaining in our budget as of February 29th. That is to say $302,000. We're going to, in the April 4th meeting, we're going to transfer $215,600 to the 1% fund. And from that 1% fund, then we will fund 
some of the things that have been discussed. So it's not in the operating budget, but taken care of appropriately in the 1%. And we have about $99,000 worth of elementary school fixes that have been put together that will also be covered by the $100,000 allocation that will be in the budget. So the gentleman that spoke was correct. A lot of things should be funded from money we actually have on hand instead of the operating budget. Um, so all of that will happen April 4th. Uh, we did a reconciliation of the 1% fund, and we also did a reconciliation of the, the elementary school fund. We are all in good shape, and there's really nothing else to add other than uh, it would be great to get into the numbers um, in the budget, and the facilities committee was invited to be part and parcel of that entire discussion. So I think we, we know the numbers, and I'm happy to say that. All right, thank you. Any questions for Valerie? Thank you, Val. Uh, long range planning. Any, uh, Alan, I'm sorry, anything to report? Yeah. Sorry. So exciting. Um, yeah, we met on the 22nd, and um, we had uh, held off on meeting uh, until after the Ag STEM uh, project uh, vote happened. Uh, because, um, partly because um, we didn't want to. Um, complicate things, but also because clearly a lot of long-range planning would have to do on whether the um, Ag STEM project was going forward or not. Uh, so we finally met, uh, and unfortunately there's a little issue is that since we hadn't met since uh, committee members were um, chosen or uh, volunteered during the summer, we usually do this at our first meeting in, in July, um, some people didn't know that they weren't on the committee. They, hadn't, they didn't happen to be at the sign-up meeting. So we had a very small meeting with the people who I thought all along were on the, uh, the meeting, in the meeting. As it turns out there are at least two other people who will be at the next meeting who expected were, at, were going to be in the committee. So I'm sorry about that uh, not turning out uh, for the last meeting. Uh, what we covered was um, essentially um, looking towards the Long Range Planning Committee refreshing and, and replacing, as a matter of fact, the um, strategic plan, the long-range goals that we have for the region, which are now at least four years old. Um, they were in the making six years ago, and they were finalized four years ago. Uh, and a lot of them are either moot or completely nicely taken care of. Um, so we want to look at things as far as issues that are still uh, evident, obviously keeping up with technology, curricular issues um, that I personally brought up that I won't go into now, but that I want us to focus on, which are ways that we can have a novel and exciting and alluring and also empowering um, uh, um, addition to our curriculum, um, which uh, has to do with you know the efficacy of learning and figuring out how to do it, but also how to impose it on, uh, on our, our current system with all the imposition that the state and federal um, agencies already put on our uh, curriculum. I know I'm talking around it because we haven't even decided it yet, but I just want to let you know that that's something, one of the things we're, we're going to talk about. Um, and then also to continue to, to look into our issues of, of population, our issues of attractiveness to the outside world, and our uh, issue of, uh, of our standards uh, and keeping them um, up and, and raising them. So basically, uh, we're going to not only meet and discuss these things as a committee, but we're also going to look into establishing something that is uh, along the lines of, of uh, uh, rudimentary forums, because we did a lot of those in our last strategic planning pro uh, process. Um, and by what I mean by rudimentary is we're going to start them out without them being too, um, um, too much of an encumbrance on the board or on the population, but it's a way of getting administration, staff, uh, um, uh, population, and board members together to, to take the temperature of the community and the, and the uh, school system and together uh, establish our new uh, long-range goals. All right, thank you. Any uh, questions for Alan? Do you have another meeting planned, Alan? <coughs> Yes, um, and our next meeting is the 5th of, 25th, uh, 25th I'm sorry, 25th of March at uh, 5 o'clock right here, and the people who are supposed to be there will be notified this time. All right, thank and you. We, and maybe we can get Anthony to join 21st. the uh, committee too. I'm sorry, 21st. 21st. Okay, 21st. You can put me down as he yes. Oh. All right, Alan, thank you. Negotiations, Greg, anything? Uh, nothing, yeah, we have, we're not engaged in any negotiations. All right, and policies and bylaws, Michelle is not here, I know whether we have uh, first readings of policies on the agenda. Alan, will you be able to handle yeah. for that for us tonight? All right. Anything else on policy that you know of? All right. 
Thank you. Then moving on to item seven, old business. Is there anyone who has any old business to bring before the board? All right, then item eight, new business uh, policies for first reading, uh, policy 3542.22, food service, code of conduct. Alan. This is a new policy for us. It's not an, um, an update or a replacement. It uh, has to do, oh, uh, hello. At least there's signals. This is <laughs> All right. Um, it should be like vote voice activated or something. Well, actually, wouldn't. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is not a uh, this is a new policy. It's not an update or a replacement policy. As you know, very often we will show you a lot of uh, yellow um, um, uh, highlighting where things have been changed. You'll see there's nothing in this, and it basically has to do with obviously an issue that um, that um, the state uh, statutes and CABE. Uh, came across and are requiring of us now. Basically, it's to keep any kind of nefarious practices from happening in our cafeterias, which would be, uh, as you, if you want to take a look at the policy, it really has to do with employees um, selling um, contracted food service items that perhaps might not be consumed, or even contracting extra stuff that means finding a way to cross the board. I believe a lot of this had to do with um, the um, increase in value of bio fuels and the very ecology of where the Spaniards who um, don't like selling the soil well are. And they had to look at oh, there's, there's, a, there's a big market on that. Um, so I think a lot of this came from that, especially almost immediately to some of the issues I see here. So there's things along those lines. So this is a little narrow policy in terms of as far as enforcement of our actual employees. Nothing is not asking them to issue here. And it's just a pro forma. It's accepted for a first reading. All right, 8.2, first reading policy 4117.4, certified non renewal slash suspension. Alan. Um, my batteries are playing good too, so I'll just be loud, maybe, in the environment. Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right, I'll make this snap you. Okay. Ooh, stereo. Um, this is a, per a personnel revision. And, and, and basically what it has to do with is the fact that there is a little bit of change in legal reference, but we also took this as an opportunity to solve a conundrum that we've often had, which is that because the budget comes out um, before, becomes, teachers have to be notified whether they're going to be renewed or not, non-tenured teachers. And very often the budget process has to do with being able to afford these teachers or not. And before the budget process is over and voted upon, you don't know this, and therefore every single teacher who is not tenured has to be sent a letter every year that says, you could be fired. And it's pretty awful. They know by now that it's not necessarily true, and very often if they even look at a budget, they'll know it's not going to be true, and the people who are tenuous due to the budget will know. But that static is being eliminated by this change in the policy, which basically moves it from April 1 to May 1, and also tightens up the, um, the back and forth between uh, teachers and um, the uh, administration if they have an issue with this. Um, in other words, there was a seven day, as you'll see in the first paragraph, there was a seven day window. And it's being broken into three and four as far as the uh, teacher having three days to respond and then the administration having four days to get back as opposed to it being seven and 15 days because we are in May, we're not in April where we used to be. All in all, just a way of making everybody a little less stressed about this issue. Greg. Move to accept the first reading. Second. Second by Anthony. All right. Is there any further discussion? Yes. Uh, uh, Valerie? I remember in the olden days, it would be part of the um, board agenda, and we voted on it because it was written in the agenda. It was just a way to do things. That doesn't stand. Oh, it will, but it's just, it it's, cool just, well, it's just it's just happening right, later. Hold on. Okay. Alan, do you want to answer that question? Um, yeah, from what I understand, that's not going to change. It's just not going to be in April, and therefore it's not going to be as many teachers. But you say in writing, you're not talking about individual then. You're still talking about published? No, the, the published won't be as necessary because by the time May 1st is about three or four or five days, depending on the calendar each year, before we vote on the referendum. Mm -hmm. So we will have had a month for that um, um, budget to be firm. Mm -hmm. So it won't be the same kind of situation where we don't know whether there are changes to the budget before this happens. Am I right? 
Pat? Greg? Uh, that is the issue? Hold on, um, if I may. Greg, would you? Yeah, I, 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 can I borrow the mic? Oh, sure. Oh, please I, I think the reason why you, you, it, it fell off the radar is because Pat hasn't been doing this. Right. Uh, she, is, she has decided it wasn't necessary. She had a, better, a good handle on it. And uh, as a result, we've just stopped doing it. So it hasn't really been an issue. But this, I think, by changing the date from April to May, gives the superintendent a lot more flexibility in the event we had an, an, you know, an OTSI year where it was necessary to do it. So I think it's a very good policy as a result. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, but I still don't understand. Is this by individual notification or published as it used to be in the in the the board packet? This this refers to either, as Greg just said. Um, Bruce used to do it blanket. Yep. Um, Pat hasn't been, but regardless whether the superintendent decides to do blanket or individual, it won't have to happen until May, which means it's much less likely that it'll be blanket. But I, I don't care so much about that. But it's in writing. I'm asking. In notified in writing. Does that mean individual letters? Yes. Yes. If so, yes. Right. So it's individual letters. It's not just a whole bunch of names, oh, no. which is what we used to have. Letters. No, what we get is, the, is a whole bunch of names to approve her writing the individual letters okay. to those people. Oh, okay. I, I didn't understand that was a question. Right, yes. That's it, a it's question. It's always individual letters, but to us, obviously, we don't see each letter. We just see the list of names. Got it. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else? It's been moved and seconded to approve 4117.4. As a first reading, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, it's approved for a first reading. Uh, thank you. Item 8.3, first reading of policy 5113.2, truancy. Now, okay, th this has a lot more yellow to it, but it's actually a lot simpler. Basically, we have some different, um, we have some statute changes as to uh, truancy, which we are um, uh, having to fold into our policy. Um, just um, as background, the... Um, Truancy, obviously, is something that is uh, a, a state issue and not just a, a, a regional issue. Very often, chronic truancy, which uh, chronic absenteeism, which is mentioned in here, is a, is a full family issue. It doesn't happen to do with, you know, we think of it in terms of old 40s uh, comedies where the kid is, is huck finning himself into, um, you know, vacation time and his parents don't know about it. It's not usually that light an issue. It has to do with parents actually aiding and abetting the kid not getting his education. And that's where the courts are involved, and that's why you have to have a, a, uh, a formal uh, process. Uh, and that's uh, how this um, policy is um, handling the, uh, the changes in the statute. And I believe it is also uh, a new uh, creation of a district uh, what are they calling it? District? Sorry. Uh, yet, uh, until I find the name of it, it's a new committee that w <laughs> very often these policies you've been noticing have uh, been statutes that are requiring um, the school system to create a uh, That's it, district attendance team. You may remember our last meeting we had policies as far as um, um, uh, 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 medical and um, other uh, drug use uh, um, and um, different things that you have to have a, a collection of administrators or teachers involved in in order to assess and discover and enforce. And yet again, this is another one which unfortunately our staff are going to be forced to comply with. But otherwise, as I said, it has to do with uh, uh, statutory changes. Greg? Uh, may I have the microphone again? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first question is, it appears, if I read this correctly, that a chronically absent child is a worse position than being a truant. Is that correct? Because it does appear that a truant, uh, you become a truant if you have 10 unexcused absences in a school year, but with our 184 days, you need 18.4 days to become a chronically absent child. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to be a more serious uh, situation to be chronically absent than truant, and that just sort of seems to stand logic on its ear. The second question, uh, since I got that right, the second question I don't understand is why the, does anyone know why the state decided to go from age 16 to age 18 on truancy? I thought there was some, it, there was some question of whether 17 and 18 year olds had something to say about whether they continued to go to school or dropped out, and now apparently that isn't the case. The other thing is I don't know how you report parents to court about an 18-year-old not attending school. Since when? Uh, well, I don't understand how parents get into the superior court because their adult child, their adult, not child, their adult student, 
chooses not to go to school. So I, I, I don't quite get this. Does anybody know what the state did? Well, the state has um, changed the, um, a, a lot of these policies have been changed due to the state making the um, limit of all school um, responsibility to, to the age of 18. Alan, you need your microphone. Right. To the age of 18. Um, uh, but what you're pointing out here, which is, which is interesting, is that this is inclusive as mm -hmm. opposed to exclusive, which is, we're going to have to look into that then, because um, the difference between chronically absent and truant is really moot depending on where they are and, and, and what the, the policy is it has to, uh, to, be, uh, to be followed. But um, it is an interesting point to find out exactly what the jurisdiction is over someone who is an 18-year-old. Um, if anything, um, we would have to replace inclusive with 5 to 17 inclusive. Um, but we'll have to figure that out as far as how, what the enforcement is. Um, All right, anyone else? Did you ever get a motion? No. No. Move to accept for a first reading. With, uh, could you add that we will uh, come back with um, revisions uh, or at least explanation? With an explanation the, about 18 years of age. Yeah. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Just to ask real quickly, because of the size of our schools, because this goes to the elementary school, uh, chronic, I mean, what's our percentage looking like? And I mean, if you got three people absent, you know, you got s more than 15%. It's interesting you should ask that because we just received this week the um, new net accountability uh, <coughs> system from the state. And um, I have that information in my bag somewhere, but I can tell you that um, we do have chronically absent students, which is very um, disturbing because to be chronically absent, you have to be absent over 18 days. Um, and I know the numbers at Chapag. Um, we have over 10% of our students, regular ed students, who are absent, chronically absent at Chapag. And out of our high um, need students, which are special education, ELL, students who receive free or reduced lunch, we have 15.5%, so 25% of Chapag students are chronically absent. Um, we also have in the other schools, I want to say that Burnham had 0%, Booth had very low, and Washington may had a couple, so that is one of the indicators that we are um, working on and that you are going to hear either at the next meeting, education meeting, or the meeting after that because there are 12 indicators that we are now graded on um, um, against the state and with the feds. And this is, a, this is a big problem. And we were talking about it today with the, I went over it with the um, instructional leaders. Uh, they said that um, early dismissal days are uh, uh, maybe part of one of the issues that there are, they always know which kids are going to be absent on early dismissal days, whether their parents don't send them, whether they don't have child care, somebody to take them off the bus afterwards. So that's one. We really have to dig deep into the data. Um, so this is a big problem. Students have to be in school um, in order to learn and, and, and you know, be present and engaged in the curriculum. So um, I will send, I sent that information already to everybody. Do you have the? Finance committee. The finance committee has it. Right, I, sent, I met with the finance committee last week and I went over it and the board, I sent it to you, um, but as part of the distinguished school packet, but we'll get it to you. Matter of fact, I have some left over from today's meeting. Um, but it, 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 there, there's issues that we have to deal with as a school system. Anthony. Uh, just to note when you do look at it, to Pat's point, our averages at the high school on both, um, both categories were higher than the state average. Yes. So um, it, oh, when, when you look behind it at the, uh, and you read the criteria, um, especially with the, with the special ed kids, mm -hmm. Um, they do take into account the extenuating circumstances that sometimes drive high absentee or what would be would drive a chronic absenteeism right. with sickness, et cetera. So that's all factored in, and, and it is a big average for the state, and, you know, like any other average, there's a distribution there. So it would be interesting, just as Pat said, to kind of peel that back. But I think without doing too much thinking, the numbers on the surface are high, mm -hmm. right? 
and I do, can I just give yes. the rest? I have it right here. Um, Washington Primary School, sorry, has um, for all students, they have 5.6%. Um, and for um, these are what chronically chronic absence. So it means students who are absent more than 18 days in a school year. This is the 2014-15 school year, and then for their high need students, they have 6.3 percent of their students. And then Booth Free, I was right. They also had for um, all of their students, they had 3.9 percent. Now realize they only have about 70 students, so. That's not a lot of students off the top of my head. What would that be? Three, three students. Two so when, three. when you have small numbers, um, it's not a lot of students. And you do have some students who are legitimately chronically absent. But um, I think with Chapag, it comes with changing of a culture again. Um, you know, that kind of laid back, um, carefree feeling that we're always fighting. Um, but we are, and it's a good fight, and I know uh, after today's meeting, I met with all the instructional leaders and Lori Ferreira and Karen and, um, and Kim, and we're working on this um, to make sure that you know, we are where we need to be and having kids in school and starting to do some real dig, digging into the data and meeting with families and students, et cetera. Now, Greg, I have a couple questions about this. Because I noticed the difference between, I didn't really notice it the first time until something you said, that the difference between a truant type absence and a chronically absent is a truant, it's got to be an unexcused absence, right. whereas a, a chronically absent, it could be, somebody could be ill, uh, and that's, that's good enough to make them a chronically absent student if, if it's 18 days, or more than 18 days. And I, w I wonder if, uh, you know, I'm wondering how, when you expect to have sort of a dig down report of why these students are absent? I mean, are there students who's, I'm assuming this is not because parents just forget to call in and their, their kids truant because they haven't bothered to call them in sick for the, uh, you know, the 10 days that year that they were, they were out due to We don't have the many flu. truant students. Okay. We don't have, so I mean, I, this year I, I signed one truant report that came over my desk. So we don't have, it's not truancy we're dealing with. All right, so are, so are we, are, I, I assume we're not also not dealing with students who have prolonged illnesses or uh, they've, they've some. you, you not, really only some. have to get the flu once to, to be knocking at the door of, of chronically absent. I mean, you could be out for three weeks uh, and there was, a, there was something that went around this year that was taking people out of the ball game for three to four weeks of illness. I know a few people in, in Roxbury, adults who were, absolutely laid on their back for four weeks this winter. So I'm wondering if it's an illness thing or is it, or, or could this also possibly be as we have made the campus unexitable that some students are just staying home on days when they have some other thing going on that requires them to be out or, or are they just not paying attention to the fact that they might be able to leave if they talked to someone about it and they had a parent come pick them up and there was an arrangement made? I'm just wondering if there are other factors that are eating into this and causing it. That seems like a ridiculously high number for a district like ours. It, it, it is high, and we are concerned. I don't want to um, you know, throw things out there other than there are some of those percentage are, we do have some chronically ill students who are legitimately ill, they're seeing doctors, et cetera. But it should not be 25% of the high school. That No way do we have that many chronically ill students. So let us do a day to dive. Let us come back with some solid information and with some strategies on how to address these issues because we want this rating to hit the target so we get full points in the accountability system. And we want our kids in school. Distinction is not between uh, excused and, and inexcused. Truant is, is unexcused, and um, chronic is excused or unexcused right. Right. because of the definition of absent. And therefore, it's, it's more of a trigger point as to truancy, which is an even more dangerous subject than chronic absenteeism because that is what involves the courts. Otherwise, this whole, because um, if you look at the policy, there's a separate issue of remediation of truancy, whereas the whole aspect of uh, the, um, the team that I can never remember the name of uh, uh, is, is put in place to deal with chronic absenteeism, mm -hmm. which might have, uh, in, in a sense, simpler but more complicated reasons, right. whereas truancy is something that is completely um, 
inexcused and therefore goes right to uh, court if necessary. Greg. Yeah, I, I just realized that I got it exactly backward. Actually, truancy is worse because it takes less to meet the threshold. Exactly. And, and that's why it's worse. And so I got it totally backwards. I apologize for that. And now I get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? All right. It's been moved uh, and seconded for, to approve this policy 5113.2 truancy for a first reading. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. It's approved for a first reading. Thank you. All right, 8.4, consider a request from Burnham School PTO to use Burnham School for their comedy night fundraising, waiving policy prohibiting alcoholic beverages for the evening of Saturday, May 21st, 2016. Is there anyone who wants, all right, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, is there anyone who wants to speak to this? Yes. Greg? Could I just say that, uh, Pete, would you accept a friendly amendment to your motion that it be Put subject you. to the usual, uh, uh, Pete, would you mind a friendly amendment that's saying that it's subject to the usual uh, uh, rules and regulations of an alcohol thing, that, you know, that there are no children in the building at the time alcohol comes in, that kind of stuff, and the insurance requirements as well? Thank you. All right. It's been moved and seconded as amended. Is there any further discussion on this? No one? All right. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. It passes. Good luck on that uh, fundraiser. <clears throat> All right, item nine, possible budget discussion. What is the board's favor? Does it, Peter? I've got a motion on the floor that we direct the superintendent of the schools and the chairman of the board to set a budget workshop date. Well, we have that, which is next Monday, uh, March 14th, 7 p.m. Is that right, Dr. Castillo? Yes, it is. All right. Is there anyone who wants to start tonight, or do we want to wait till then? Uh, Al, uh, Peter, I'm sorry. Nothing's Wait. happened. There it Green. goes. Go ahead, Peter. It takes time to digest what we heard tonight from members of the public. And uh, that's fine. didn't comment on anything because we were here basically to listen to the public. Right. I, you know, I, and I, the superintendent. The man who spoke at the end, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Matt Denning, I, I didn't mean to be, um, and I possibly came off as uh, short with him. I should not have done that, but it's not. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on agenda items. The board just does not get into discussion with folks about it. It would just go on all night. He wanted some a board member to come up to the podium and defend this. This has just been presented to us, so I didn't mean to be uh, short with him. And if I was, I apologize to him for that. All right, is there anyone else? But Valerie. Well, yeah, I think it's very important. When things start percolating in one of the towns or any of the towns and <coughs> parents come out at night to to ask these questions that I, it's very difficult in the form that we have, but they've really got to be treated with respect and told, sir, we, and I'm glad you apologized. <coughs> We understand your concerns. We really want to address them. We're going to talk about this on the 14th. Please come to our meeting on the 14th. Because that just gets everyone madder when they feel ignored, when they've taken the time. Um, and I did explain a few things to them. And hopefully, when they come on the 14th, they'll understand more. Um, I want to compliment Pat on what I think is an extremely reasonable budget. Um, in view of the pressures put on the school system. I'm a little concerned that a lot of people left here thinking that we are sacrificing the elementary schools for the Ag STEM, which we are not doing. These are two totally separate funded issues. And in fact, you know, we can do more with the elementary schools now. So I think it's really important to be polite and to kind of nip some of this um, n not you know, illogical comments, just a little misinformed or not misinformed, people are really concerned. I am concerned about the $250,000 for the teacher's lounge. That's the only thing in this budget that bothers me because I do know that Pat, and we will talk about this on the 14th, I won't be there, sadly, so that's why I'm taking the time now. Um, I know Pat has covered the elementary school teachers appropriately because of the population. We have um, three kindergartners 
and seven first graders for a total class of? Eight first graders were as of today. Um, six second graders, eight third graders, 11 fourth graders, and 14 fifth graders. So you have a K-1 class of 11 students, mm -hmm. and you have a 2-3 class of 14 students. Um, and a fourth grade class of 11. 11, and then a fifth grade class of 14. Because the parents don't realize these numbers. They're just looking kind of in a microcosm setup, and they, they don't see that, that what we're looking forward to, how we, we come to these conclusions. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I tried to explain a few things uh, one parent said, well, yeah, we should have a class of three okay. with a teacher. I mean, why not? And so sometimes logic escapes. But I, I think we have to, we, you guys on the 14th, if these people hear about the workshop on the 14th, which I hope they do, good luck, because this is an angry group. And I do think, as nice as it would be to do something with the teacher's office space lounge, 250 is really, really rich, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. I would rather see the budget fly through without a lot of sturm und drang than to have it held up at this crucial time when we've had our voters approve a massive bond issue for us. I, I'd rather, like, keep a lower profile, and the 250 for a teacher's lounge, though it'd be lovely, is really rich for a lot of taxpayers right now. All right. Greg? Uh, two, two things. Uh, Pat, I would hope that this budget workshop, there's an opportunity for give and take with the people who have questions and the, and the people that come in. I think we have to have more give and take, and I think that we, I think you need to be prepared to have your staff there, your, your curriculum staff, your education professionals, to talk about what the reasons for this are. Uh, I understand that the, that the multi-age classrooms are not primarily a budget issue. What they really are is an educational issue. You need to explain that, and I think you need to explain how you're going to staff them so that we don't have people wandering around with, uh, with views where they don't quite understand what's being done. And I, th I think that's very important, and it needs to be give and take, and there needs to be an opportunity for them to understand why you're doing it, you to understand what their concerns are, and I think that's, that's good. The, the second thing about the teacher's lounge, the teacher's so-called lounge I want to talk about, is it's not a teacher's lounge, and we have to stop calling it a teacher's lounge. That area back there, first of all, it's an enormous area. Second of all, it's used for the teachers uh, to be able to, to do lesson prep, to, to plan things. They meet with students back there. They administer certain testing back there. Uh, this is a student area as well. It's an educational area and it's a critical area. The other thing that that so-called lounge does is it, it, it's going to be the space where they can store the materials that they are not using on a day-to-day -day basis in their classrooms so we can get those materials out of the classrooms. Why do we want to do that? Because we need better furnishings. We need to have classrooms that are easier for our uh, maintenance staff to clean. We have air quality issues. We can't have air quality issues and we're not going to have air quality issues but when we have classrooms stuffed with stuff that makes it days and days and days for our our maintenance staff to move stuff out of there in the summers to clean it is it really becomes a problem plus all of that stuff in there creates air quality issues so this is also about a healthy school it's about meeting the standards it's about providing educational space and if we keep calling it a teachers lounge there are visions of people thinking well that's where the teachers go to eat lunch and and uh, in the old days, they would have been in there smoking cigarettes, which isn't done anymore. But the idea is you're thinking it's a lounge. It's not a lounge. It's, it's their fundamental workspace and our teaching space. And so that's why I want to make sure we understand that. And the reason it's $250,000 is there's a lot of pieces and elements to it in that space to get it up to the level that it needs to be to function properly and to improve the educational uh, perspectives of the school. All right, and, and one other thing, uh, just to state for the record, I mean, with regard to public involvement and comment on the budget, once the board approves a budget and presents it, there will be a public hearing at which there will be interaction with the staff, public, public can ask questions, and we'll, the board or staff members will be there to answer the questions the best that we can. So, I'm sorry, Rebecca? The issue is, are we going to go into this tonight, I guess, or are we going to come back on the 14th and start then? Rebecca? And you can say whatever you wish, that's fine. 
Um, I'm, I'm more interested in going in depth next week because, as Pete said, I, I do need an opportunity to digest. Um, but along the lines of what Valerie was talking about um, and what a couple other members have alluded to, uh, separate from what the members of the public are looking for, as a board member, um, I have concerns about the two, three, and uh, including the curriculum, including the differences in requirements for grades two and grades three. And I, I need that kind of information at this workshop to get behind this if it's a good idea. And regarding the logic of of a three student classroom versus a 10 student versus a 20 student. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certainly not an expert on it. I've, try, I've started to do some of my own research on it. And for every one small article about a small classroom being a problem, and it's usually a problem with a small p, you see endless articles and studies about uh, classrooms that are over uh, enrolled and the students that are suffering for that. <coughs> So I think that we have to be very thoughtful and we have to be very um, clear in terms of if we are going to put forward a 2-3 classroom, why that is a good solution Absolutely. for our students. Um, I am not yet convinced that it is, and I'm interested to know what it's going to look like. All right, thank you. Uh, did you want to respond? Sure. Go ahead. I just want to get a little background information, being that we're here, we have a little time. Um, we have a, I'm sorry. There we go, 12, a foot, Karen's foot. Um, the K-1 class currently has been in effect for two years. It's been very, very successful. It's had one teacher. This year the teacher's been on maternity leave, um, so it's had a substitute teacher. And it has um, one para. Uh, she may be a literacy tutor, or whatever. She, but she is a retired teacher. She's wonderful. It's a beautiful setup. They currently this year have, I believe, 14 students, um, mostly boys. I don't know the exact number, but uh, it's probably 10 to 4, something like that. Um, and I've been in it many, many times. It works beautifully. We are a school system that does a lot of um, individualized work. We use a workshop model for reading and writing. And this goes all the way to grades five, K through five. So what does that mean? Um, it, it's based on Lucy Calkins, but we have added elements of it, teachers reading and writing <coughs> workshop. So you start with some kind of um, objective for the day, uh, maybe you know, looking at character traits. Um, you teach a mini lesson. And then you move into some guided reading groups. So that's where you group kids together with specific needs. So right there, you have some individualized instruction. You move kids into just write books, which are books that they read independently, do log work, some writing work. Again, individualized instruction. Um, and the math also moves into a lot of the same kind of uh, individualized work kind of like the workshop model, a little more intense uh, with specific skills per grade. But we do a lot of small group instruction. Um, the current sec first grade has six students, first grade. So they're going into second grade. <coughs> Forgetting about the fiscal part of a budget, as an educator of many, many years, it is not healthy to have six students in a classroom. They've been together since kindergarten. It's not healthy. Um, so I am making the proposal to put second and third grade together. After discussions with Mrs. Colella and Mrs. DeBrito and the teachers, spoken to um, the second grade teacher there, the big concern about the second, third grade class is math. Okay, because we have to come before math. Uh, we have a lot of, sorry. Oh no, we have battery problems. That's what we need up here. We need batteries and battery problems. There we go. Um, after speaking to um, some of my curriculum people and, and educators, um, I decided to make a 2-3 class, because I think 14 kids in a 2-3 class is an excellent amount of kids in a class. I think teaching reading and writing 
is similar, whether it's 14 second graders or 14 third graders, because it's the same model and they are going to have individualized instruction in different parts of the workshop model. Because the math was such a concern, I compromised. And instead of cutting the, I didn't cut a teacher, remember, I didn't cut a teacher. I made that teacher, and let's just say it's the third grade teacher, just uh, not a person, but just that third grade teacher. I made that third grade teacher teach math to the first grade and math to the third grade, which means now that teacher is responsible to teach math. That classroom teacher now does not have to teach math mathematics to her whole class. So for example, in the second, third grade split, one teacher will teach six students mathematics, and one teacher will teach eight students mathematics. Um, as far as the SBAC goes, you know, uh, one of my um, goals is high expectations for all kids. When you're in a 2-3 class, those second graders are going to rise to the top. And if there are kids who can't, for whatever reason, we have a lot of support in that building. We have math interventionists, we have reading interventionists, we have tutors, we have paras. I mean, I go in a class sometimes, and there are eight kids and three adults. And it happens quite often. And we're very fortunate to have that. But, but I, as the educational leader, I see those things. So yeah, the SBAC, what I told the teacher when she said that to me, I said, if I have to provide some extra support, and by that I mean I can go in, I can send Ms. O'Hara in, I can send Mr. Brito in and do some extra support with those students, we will do that. We have flexibility in staff to be able to help if we need help. But I can't see how anything that you do to prepare for SBAC for the third graders will not be hurtful or non-educational to the sick second graders. We do have to work on the curriculum because we want it to be multi-age. Yes, there is a consultant from Arizona who Ed Connection is bringing down that I'm in contact with to maybe come in and do some work with us. Um, this is not a foreign uh, concept. This is what Montessori is built on, okay? I mean, this is something that happens all the time. Um, to say that I'm take, we're, we're taking away from the elementaries to ag STEM is not true. I am adding a tag and an enrichment person so someone can support the sciences in grades three, four, and five, okay? Um, and get them excited about staying here so when they, you know, they know this is what ag STEM's gonna be, this is how we teach science, so maybe they don't leave from five to six. Um, I did not go to the parents, although I did go to the leaders of Burnham, including the PTO president and the principal and the selectmen and the board member, and explained my thoughts. Um, I think it's inappropriate to meet parents and sit down before I make a presentation to the board. Um, again, I, I think it's a really good plan. I am confident that we will be able to um, meet the Spanish expectations that we've had for the last couple of years with a 0.5 Spanish person. Um, and that's where I am. I can come next week. We can give you some more information. But we have very um, engaging teachers. Um, the second grade teacher was very excited when I spoke to her about the possibilities and all of the exciting things we can do. Um, I think 14 students is um, doable. I mean, when I look at WPS, first grade has more, second grade has more, third grade has more, fourth grade has more. So, you know, <coughs> you know, it, it's just, it, it is what it is. I'm trying to balance our resources, be responsible, be fair, um, and meet everybody's needs. 
So that's where I'm coming from. I just wanted to give everybody a little balance information. I thought about it. I've been thinking about this for a very, very long time. Um, we're going to support everyone. We're going to, to you know, redo the um, curriculum and look <coughs> at standards to make sure we're hitting all the standards. Um, and I think it's very doable because we have some really great creative people to, to make it work. So that's just my two cents so people can. Peter? Is my motion in the cloud right now? I'm trying. Where is my motion? Did you make a motion? I did. Remember, about a half about an hour the 14th. ago. 14th. All right. Well, we're in discussion. We're in Your motion is to adjourn? My motion was to, for the chairman and the superintendent of the schools, set a date for a budget workshop. Which is the 14th. Right. And That's I said, yeah, all right, okay. Valerie, yeah. the budget workshop is next Monday, a week from today, 7 o'clock, right here. Valerie. But I do think it's important that the budget workshop, once again, what you were just explaining, what you've explained in, in our workshops in the finance committee is very important. And one thing that struck me about this at least particular group of parents that showed up is that they are young. <coughs> they don't know some of the background that we have been living and breathing. They're not aware of our restrictions about having, having to have a K-5 in every town. They think it's silly that we, you know, don't take some of those grades and and merge them with another school. Can't do it. Um, they don't know. Some of them are not that aware of this steep decline in population. So I would suggest that a presentation of basics like that, what we would consider basics, but it's kind of new if you're not here, you know, as often as we are. Um, uh, someone mentioned he lived in Washington and his kids go to Burnham. Right. Yeah, we should be encouraging that. And I know it, it means more bus time, but I don't know why we can't encourage that uh, short term. We do. And the fact that we can reassure some parents that this is, this is indeed a Montessori model. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to proceed along these lines of multi-age, it would be great for all of us to be on, on board, but the reality is still the restrictions this school system has. And a lot of those parents just don't know it. So we look like idiots that we haven't thought of it. Well, we've thought of it for 10, 20, 30 years, just can't do anything about it. So as much background as possible, <clears throat> including demographics, would be smart for Monday. Mm -hmm. And I, once again, I go back to they're going to definitely make a correlation between 250 for a teacher's lounge or study area or office area, they're, they're going to do that and link it with the cost of teachers. Um, I don't know how you're going to break that linkage. And it bothers me a great deal because we want the budget to pass. And I would like the facilities committee to really look long and hard at their budget for the teacher's office slash lounge. It seems pretty, pretty rich after we've spent and gone over budget in the mall. Hold on, Greg, please. Is there anything else, Bill? I'm done. Alan? Uh, yeah, I just, you know, what I was, Thank you. I really hope we can go into detail <coughs> on this issue. Oh, do any of these work? Um, there we go. I, I really hope we can go into detail on, on this issue because it's been, um, it's kind of been moved down the path um, because I was, of course, was part of the uh, Selectman and, and Bridgewater to talk to Pat about this. And I feel that it's always been something, and, and Pat said that she's been thinking about this long and hard, uh, but I think she's been thinking about how to get this to happen long and hard and not about um, uh, alternatives or how this may not be necessary. Um, because it is an idea that will work with the proper support, and Pat has pledged that there will be this support, but it also seems like it is fraught with potential um, disasters. It's also fraught with, you know, it all working beautifully. But my opinion is that um, it is a complex change that is not entirely necessary at the moment based on staffing, and that I, I, I need to, to have uh, the superintendent tell us at our meeting next week exactly what the what the impetus is because she says sometimes that it's 
you know, the idea of, uh, you know, three kids in a class or six kids in a class or balancing resources. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the, not only the effect on the kids, but also, of course, on the effect on, on what, on retaining, as some of these parents talked about, retaining um, uh, students in the system and, and retaining families and also being attractive to new families. Um, and I'm also concerned on a curricular level. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, it's funny because we talked about this several years ago when, when um, a previous superintendent wanted to merge four or five. And it was so funny, I got a lot of talk from parents. It was like, oh my God, this is going to be terrible or it's going to be great. Um, and a lot of them talked about how beneficial it is for a fourth grade student. At that time, it was fourth and fifth grade. Um, how beneficial it would be for a fourth grade student to be, you know, um, mentored by a fifth grade and rise to that level, as Pat says is possible with the second and third grade students. And then I realized that every kid, you know, every parent thinks their kid is, gonna, is exceptional and is going to be brought up to snuff. But then there's the consideration of what about the f fourth grade kids who don't? Well, they need support. What about the fifth grade kids who, who, who are barely making it at the fifth grade level? Well, they can hang with the fourth grade. And that implies two different curriculum, as opposed to multi-age, which is really individualized curriculum, which still hasn't yet been written, and we're th six months away. And then on top of that, there's the issue of, of second and third. All of our precursors and all of our precedents for merging uh, classes in, in a multi-age, because multi-grade is really two separate curricula, which is something else that I want to talk about next week, is, is three and four, not two and three. Um, and it's hilarious that just today, without obviously without knowing anything about this, my son was homesick, and he was talking about a friend of his who was very close, you know, because Burnham is a small school, all the grades intermingle. A friend of his, he's in fifth grade now. Last year when this person was in second grade, he's, so those second graders, they are, they are just so adorable and fun. And then they get to third grade, they're totally different. They're all sassy and impossible. And you are dealing with a maturity change there, which is why a lot of multi-age is 3-4 and not 2-3. So I feel that we are, you know, through, through Pat's you know, strong force of will, which is, is to be commended because she's brave and she wants things to happen that she feels are necessary, we are plowing into something which is, as I said, if you have the... the, the the, the will, and I know she does, uh, to, to overcome it, there, that, that's, that's the reason to do it, but I'm afraid that there are a lot of signs that it's not the best idea, and I really hope we can get into the details on it on uh, next Monday. All right, does anyone else who wants to speak to Peter's motion, which is basically we'll adjourn and meet mm -hmm. on Monday? Is there anyone else? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, we've got a budget meeting next. Monday, 7 o'clock here, budget workshop. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor say aye. We're adjourned.